This episode was sponsored by Santos Threads. Make sure to visit Santos-Threads for the latest and greatest in men's and women's Latino hip-hop-inspired streetwear apparel. Visit santos-threads.com. Hey, you are now listening to the Santos Says Podcast, episode number 23. Once again with you, your host, Santos, proud owner of Santos Threads, here with you guys once more. Happy to be here, episode number 23. On this episode, I have a special guest. This person on this, the person on this episode is someone who is a legendary figure in the hip-hop game, opened up tons of doors for Latinos, somebody who I consider a pioneer, someone who has really put it down for the game um, for a long time. And he goes by the name of Don Dinero, Cuban-American rapper, uh, been in the game a long time, one of the first, if not the first, I I will uh, certainly ask him the question, one of the first Latino rappers who rap primarily in Spanish to have uh, a joint venture deal, um, a major joint venture deal, which he had with Universal uh, in the early 2000s. So I will ask him about that. Um, certainly we'll touch uh, base with him as far as see where he's at, uh, what he's got cooking now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about his history, some of his background. So talk a little bit about the underrated history of um, Cubans in New York City, because, um, you know, there there's really... You know, Cubans have a long history in uh, New York City, and um, I think that story needs to be told. Um, obviously, primarily starting in the 60s, the early 60s, but um, there's a lot, you know, the Cubans really left their footprints in New York City for a long time, and I think it's kind of an underrated aspect of the city, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, it's been well documented about Puerto Ricans, um, what Puerto Ricans' contributions have been, right, in New York City and to hip hop, et cetera. But um, I do think, you know, the Cuban impact in New York City as a whole, not just in, in, in music, just as a whole in, in society, in America, um, New York really, you know, people talk a lot about Miami and Miami, obviously, rightly so, is, is a major hub. But it used to be New York as well. New York has a big, has a, a, a long tradition and history uh, with Cubans and Cuban Americans alike. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that with him as far as some of his beginnings, because I think a lot of people don't realize where he's from. He, he actually grew up in New York. So, um, you know, he was originally from New York, uh, Washington Heights. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, not only be- for his music career, um, for his mentality as far as how he took it, how he approached business. Um, I really respect and admire the way he went about his whole career. I really do, because he's always he's never approached anything with the mindset of um, being an employee. I love the fact, and, and myself being a business person, someone who admires entrepreneurs as well, I know he's an entrepreneur. And he's always approached the music industry in that way. Not only has he done it with music, but he's also done it with clothing, which he also has a clothing line, which um, we'll talk about as well. Um, as you all know, I also I, I, I do clothing as well. So um, I, I love what he does. He has a nice clothing line as well clothing brand. So we'll talk a little bit about that and um, we'll get into it. I'm waiting for Don Dinero to come in here. Uh, definitely, we're going to have Don Dinero, one of the greats, man. He's he's had a great career. You know, Don Dinero's had a tremendous career, um, not only commercially, but also um, for his other things he's done. As I mentioned, I have a great deal of respect for him on the entrepreneurial side because anytime I see a Latino who approaches things with the mindset of that of a of an entrepreneur, of a boss, an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I'm always for that. That's something that's always going to, um, you know, I'm going to gravitate towards. And certainly, his situation is no different. You know, um, I I really appreciate that. Anytime you see a Latino who's had success, a Latino who's really um, been instrumental in this hip hop culture, with not only the Cubans, obviously. Um, a Cubano, but he keeps it real with all the Latinos, and I always respected that. I, I think that's that's great. Um, I think we, as a society and as a whole, I'm, I, and just in general, we're so quick to kind of 
bring people down or just remember people once they've passed on. And I, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. We got to give people their props, their credit, their just do while they're here. Um, you know, because quite frankly, um, you know, when it comes to Latinos in this hip hop, we've made tons of contributions. There's been tons of us that have really put it down that have, um, there've been tons of Latinos that have put it down, that have made history in this game. Um, whether in English or in Spanish, because Spanish, it, it counts just the same as well. Um, you know, Spanish that I, I would, I would vouch, I would make the argument that, that right now Latin music is, is about as popular as it's ever been. And it's going to continue to get that way, uh, be that way because, um, you know, the Latinos in this country continue to, uh, grow in numbers and, and, and influence. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's just a, an amazing thing. So. Uh, very much looking forward to hearing what Dinero has to say about that. Some of his um, beginnings. We'll talk a little bit about his hits. You know, he's got hits too. He's got hits. He's got and and, and so just to get into those things for sure. I really uh, fascinated in in picking his brain on on some of those things. Welcome here. First of all, it's it's an honor and a privilege. I want to welcome the legendary. Um, yes, I say legendary because this man, he's, he's a great pedigree. He's been around for a long time, and he's put it down. He's a, a legend in the game. English or Spanish, he's tight with his rhymes. All right? I want to bring him in. El Cubano. I'm bringing him in right now. The legendary Don Dinero. Oh, yeah. Well, I was good, my brother. Yeah. How you doing? Listen, thank you. I, I know it was a long time coming, so... Man, you know, I ain't gonna lie. I apologize. You know, I don't like to be late for nothing, my brother. And I was caught up doing some shit and I checked. He said, Pasado, and I was like, yo, I seen your message with the link. I was like, oh. So I apologize. I know I'm a few minutes late, but I'm here. No, 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 no. Te preocupe. It's all good, brother. It's all good. I, I appreciate you coming on. And in fact, so I was just watching, right, one of your posts. I gotta say, um, I love what you do with your... um with your Instagram and your TikTok, right? So what you do with, the, I be rolling when I watch the Swagata. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I started saying Swagata. Let me tell you what that came from. So my son, you know, if I could show you my oldest son, I don't know if I could get ahead. So my oldest son, you know, he a college all American. He was everything. So he, this is all his stuff, right? This is my office more or less so you can see. So, my son in college, you know, even now, he's a monster. So when he used to get to the free throw line, I'd be at the college games. And by, and by the time he would shoot the ball, you could hear me in the same swag I thought, and it would go, and it's going in, right? So I kind of, you know, use that. And, I, you know, I have words, squeaky. I got a lot of shit. So people that around me, my kids, they'd be like, what's wrong with you? So I just create words that means something but kind of stick you know in a weird way so that's where swaka that kind of comes from so now i use that and then let that sink in which is me and my, my partner chris Gotti. we always say this in life you know you gotta try shit. you know i've never really been a big component of social media uh i think one of my biggest downfalls in the game is that i love the money but i didn't love the fame and i realized you have to be famous to make a ton of money besides selling your ass and your soul that's a whole nother question uh topic people don't I, know about um, that some people don't know about that though you're right it's true i mean again that's it's it's because you know less than there's 22 million independent artists in the united states less than one percent would ever get a deal so there's very few people you know uh, getting a record deal is almost like winning the lotto now we know everyone plays the lotto right of course how many lotto winners you know <laughs> i'll wait by grandma abuelita tío People play that shit religiously, bro. They don't and, win. You know, I mean, once in a blue moon, they'll hit a pick three or pick four. They'll win. You know, so what I'm saying is that the music industry is kind of like that. So when you see a Cardi B go from being a stripper exploding, now you have every stripper trying to be a rapper. It's cool, but it's kind of like just because you wear Jordans, you're not going to be Michael Jordan. You get what I'm saying? There's only I one love Michael that. Jordan. I love that that analogy. Nah, I, I feel you on that. And, and you know, um, you're certainly somebody who could speak for that because I know, first of all, I, I want to talk a little bit about like with you, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of people don't know. I want to talk a little bit about your beginnings because I know that I've been following you from the beginning, right? I, I was a fan. I bought your first album. 
Thank yeah, well, you. Well, I bought that album, all right? And I, yeah, I know... Yeah. Right there, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had that, bro. Let me tell you, that album... I'm about me. to drop it as an NFT. There you go. So people can <laughs> invest in the album and make money with me, kid. That's Love what, that. But that's, that's, we'll, we'll, that's a whole different subject, but we'll, we'll discuss that after. But go ahead, you were saying. For sure. Yeah, yeah, nah. So, you know, what I wanted to talk about is like, who were some of the people who influenced you? Because I rem I heard you, right, for the first time, I heard you on actually on Cuban Link's album that didn't come out in right. English. My right. cartel. Right? Yes, full full blooded yes, Cuban motherfucker that upshack the pedigree, yes, right? Yes, Remember yes, that? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. That was my introduction to you. So then when I saw you come out in a full Spanish album, it was mind blowing to me. Because you actually, not only that you could dominate the Spanish language, but you could make it so that it's marketable. marketable. What were your well, I mean, you thoughts? Great, you know, those are great questions. But, you know, uh, the upbringing of hip-hop in my blood is because I was born and raised, you know, I'm a, I'm a triple, triple OG. I, I was born in the 60s. I'll leave it there. Right? So I went through hip-hop in the 70s. It was in my blood. So... But at that time, we didn't really have successful Latinos who were out like they were Latinos. They might have been Latinos, but they weren't saying. So the 80s comes through, and we have a lot of great records. Def Jam gets started, and the Beastie Boys and LL, and I'm living through all that. You know, I, 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 the hip-hop and rapping was kind of the elements that we had. So in my little team, there was break dances. I always used to rap and do this stuff. So I remember when I joined the Army, I joined the Army back in the first Iraq War. And I recorded my first single in Europe, just out of the blue. It was called High Stepping. And out of nowhere, I'm in Greece doing my thing, and the record blew up. And I ended up doing, I toured with uh, uh, Naughty by Nature, Beastie Boys. I had a song called High Stepping. It was a Barry White mix called High Stepping, Hip Dressing Fella. Yeah. And I and I came out saying, I'm a high stepping, hip dressing fella, smooth, smooth like a cello, never get upset. You know, that kind of rap back then. Right, right, yeah, that was, that, that was the but, vibe. But everything I ever touched kind of took off a little bit. I always added a little Spanglish to my stuff. I came home, I went to prison. And when I went to prison, I really dedicated myself to writing. I had all the time in the world. And I said, when I come home, I, I want to get into this shit. And that's kind of how I met Cuban and Joe and them at a party. And then I started rocking with Cuban. And I learned a lot about the business through hanging around uh, a lot of the big, big artists, you know, that they were doing. I, I got on Cuban's album, uh, uh, which was a, a great, great opportunity for myself. But what I noticed being around the terror squad and punning them was that Latinos were supporting a lot and the need for Spanish language rap. All I wanted to do, I didn't reinvent the wheel. I'm like, fuck, if I could take this same production, but spit it in Spanish, because I knew how to read and write. I said, now, not only do I have something, I'm in my own lane. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the mystery of Don De Niro comes from on my first video. I spent almost $250,000 doing the record with, with Cuban, uh, the Where You At record. We shot the video in Miami, it was crazy. But, uh, me and him kind of had a disagreement. Business and money doesn't mix. We kind of had a falling out. So I kept it moving with my company and said, fuck it, I'm just going to go to Miami and do a Spanish album. And that's when I recorded the Que Ola album. And I took Pit uh, Cuban off of the Where You At record. I put Pit on that record. And on that record, because Pit kind of had an understanding of what me and Cuban went, then he put that one verse. That, that kind of started their whole. What we got, we got. Yeah, we're we're gonna do it. without weak links. Now we're gonna do it. Now we're gonna do it without weak links. Weak just think. So that one verse really turned it. Um, I never had this records against Cuba. He said it once, and that was at the moment. That's what what Pit was about, you know. Uh, and we can't, you know, that album exploded. Along with that, my career exploded. Along with that, Pit Bull's career exploded. Right, all those things. At the time, I was pushing Black Royal, so I was also. Uh, in constant communication with Akon at the beginning stages of, you know, always asking for advice what I was doing because the key element to Don DeNero was that I've been independent my entire career. My entire career, you know, when you look at back then of the records that came out beside myself, the second artist to have success was Tego Calderon. Then came Don Omar, then Daddy Yankee with Gasolina. So, you know, all those records from back then, those artists do not own those records. Those labels own those records. But all my records, I'm in the process of now doing a huge deal for this album 
to get it all over when it comes to movies besides the NFT because I own that intellectual property. But I, I also dropped a ton of, I dropped two other albums on my joint venture. I have almost 10 albums out. My latest album dropped January 6th called Cuban Connection, which is kind of like a compilation with all the guys I'm dealing with. King Problem, Richie Rich, Trigger Mike. I have Brida, who's a Grammy Award winner, signed to Rock Nation. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of things, but I've always really loved the business aspect of it. You know, um, I'm extremely creative. So as far as the music, that was, I wouldn't say easy. The hardest part was getting the people to hear it. And, uh, and you know, I got the song on radio and it changed my life forever. The Pana Pana. Bro, I'll tell you, and, and we, since we're talking about that album, right? Because how, see, to me, it's fascinating because I, I know the story about that album, which you said that you were independent. How were you able to get Universal? It always fascinated to me. It was fascinating to me how you got Universal to buy in. Because I was, the president at Universal at the time was Johnny Cheradilla, and the vice president was Walter Combs. Reggaeton was, was only in Puerto Rico. They had it on mixtapes in, in, in up north where the Boricuas were at in New York and Boston. And in the Bicosis, the Mexicanos, and all of those were doing tours a lot in Colombia and stuff like that. But on the radio in the United States, there was nothing. It was so crazy that when I blew up, when you said, how did I get Universal to pay attention? Well, they didn't pay attention. They didn't give a shit. Uh, me and my brother, we, God rest his soul, my brother passed away uh, uh, on March 13th. Sorry to hear that. He, he, he was the number one supporter. And what we did is our plan was I made 10,000 copies of, of the Pana Pana single and gave it away back then when there was no, not even MySpace, no social media. We gave it away to the barrio, to the car washes, the barbershops, the cafeterias, the way the people roamed. And the minute you listen to that one record, it didn't stop spinning. So the labels and the radio stations was like, wait a second, we're playing this on the radio, but the streets are playing this guy named Don Dinero. With it. What happened? So I had, uh, they invited me for an interview at the radio station. Um, I spoke, they played Pana Pana. I never looked back. Now, there were no records on, no reggaeton at all on radio. There was nothing. I have to tell the story because I'm going to do the documentary. This is what makes Dinero. Johnny Chevaria used to sit with his staff of 30 people at Universal and say, how are two brothers kicking our ass with the number one record in Miami? And it's because we had the streets. I applied the street team tactic to the Spanish game because the Spanish game would take a Mark Anthony song from the studio and give it straight to the program director and play it. You couldn't do that in hip hop. No. Nope. So I was pushing hip hop tactics and mentality, me and my brother owning our own shit. I didn't learn it. I learned that from, from OG Juan and Jay-Z at Rock Nation. I learned that from Irv Gotti and Chris Gotti at Murder, Inc right owning putting your own money up putting your own skin in the game going out and marketing your music and then sitting back so when you say how did i get them to pay attention i'm telling you i got on the fucking radio and and they thought my name is don denero they're like the only way he got on radio he must have dropped the bag bag <laughs> because at that time they were only if you let me tell the story it's crazy so at that time they were only I want to educate you on a few things when you when they say is your song commercial. You know, a lot of guys say I'm doing a commercial record, right? Right. right. I'll tell you how that terminology came. Back then, they would only have 16 records on rotation an entire day. That was their thing. For you to crack that 16, you had to squeaky. You had to yeah, pay yeah, that one yeah, yeah. my nigga. You had to pay <laughs> that one right? right? And the way it worked was it's four song slots. So they play the weakest song first. Boom, boom. The fourth song was the hottest song. So they could play a commercial after that record because radio stations don't sell music. They sell fucking products and advertising. advertising right? So yeah. if your song was commercial, you know what that meant? They can run a commercial after your fucking record, homeboy. So they can sell yeah. shit. That's what made it commercial. So they right. would run one, two, three, four commercials. One, two, three, four commercials. Now you have eight records. One, two, three, four commercials. One, two, three, four commercials, then the rotation would start again. That's why you would hear the radio station, and every hour you would hear the new record. Or every two hours you would hear that record, and that's called rotation. It rotated on your ass. Every guy on rotation was a part of a major label at that moment. What me and my brother did, you could never do. It's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's impossible back then without social media, without nothing. But we did it because we had a street tactic. So once I got on radio and they played the record, we left. 
my brother was like, I fucked it. We did our part radio station, but what we didn't know was the power of the people. They were calling that fucking radio station nonstop. I was there from nine. I was there from 9.50 because the shit ended at 10. I spoke for five minutes. From 9.55 to 10, they played my record. Their, their morning show was over. Have a nice life, Mr. Uh -huh. Dog It was nice. The people didn't call. Leo Velak showed up at 1 o'clock. 11, 12, three hours later. He calls my brother at 1.30. He says, listen, the most requests we've ever had for a record was a Celia Cruz record. We had about 300 calls. We've had more than 3,000 calls for your brother's fucking record. It's going on rotation at 3 o'clock. That's how we changed the game. Wow. The people yeah. changed the game. After that, my life changed. And then once we got on rotation, when Elias Santego, they was like, all right, this nigga's on the road. How it works is if he's on there, how can we get on there? And then Leo Vela, Salsa 95, ends up being number one because they spun me for three months before they spun any other record. And Soul didn't want to spin me. They didn't believe in me. And then the pressure was so much when the ratings came out three months later and Salsa became the number one radio station because the only way you could listen to, you couldn't go to YouTube. Nope. You couldn't go to Spotify. Nope. You had to go to Salsa 98 to listen to Pana Pana. That's when I changed the game. And then I charted Billboard. But guess where I charted? Tropical. They had no urban charts, Papa. Way no before tropical. any of those guys. Go see whoever charted first. It's Don Dinero. And then everyone else, I'm charting, I was like number 17 or something. And then you have Celia Cruz, she was alive. Mark Anthony. But I chart on Billboard. Every artist on Billboard is associated with a major label. Right. And here I am, Don Dinero, Cuban Connection Records. Because people say how to get the Cuban Connection. That was my first label, Cuban Connection. Yeah. So here it is. Everybody's charting you. And here I am, Pana Pana, Don Dinero, Cuban Connection Records. That was unheard of. So that's the attention. Then... I didn't even have distribution. And when I finally get distribution, my first day that my album comes out in Ricky Records all in Miami, I sell out of every fucking store. Wow. I did an in-store and I signed autographs for five hours. I had sweat coming out of my ass. The people didn't stop. The lady comes out and said, we have no more CDs for sale. Right? So it was a phenomenon. They never seen. So that's when the label said, holy shit. Not only are he's on radio. That's cool. We got on radio. Now he's selling records. He's having people go to the fucking store, buy his record, and stand in line and get a sign. This urban shit works. And that's when they, Gustavo Lopez woke up and signed uh, Looney Tunes. And then he came up with Machete Records. And, and then the game changed. But wow. I was still doing hip hop. Then I waited two and after 2002, I dropped that. I waited almost three years doing features, and my album was that good that I wrote out. I dropped this album a lot. I dropped Yo No Say. I, I, I wrote out that album because they were offering me uh, artist deals, and I'm like, I would never be the artist. So I signed myself. I opened Don De Niro Music, and I signed myself. Now, if you want to do business, if you want to sign Don De Niro, no problem. You got to talk to Jose Guitian, which is me, and I would sit there and now let's talk. So I negotiated the first joint venture out of any land artist, Ricky Martin didn't even have a fucking joint venture. They were all signed to the label. Mark Anthony to this day is signed to Sony. Sony. Now, yes, he makes millions of dollars. He made, Mark Anthony's made 50 million. The label's made a billion off of him. But that's another subject. We won't go Ooh, there. Right? That's good. So that's another subject. We won't go there because Mark Anthony's a great, incredible artist. And it is what it is. It's the business they were in. So now here I am, you know, when I tell you when I control my own destiny. So I signed a joint venture for two albums. They gave me a ton of bread, 50-50 profit split. I own the masters. You feel me? I control the masters. I give you the single, and you pay for the marketing. And I dropped the I would like a C album with the Ante La Calle, to yep. Ante La Calle, right? I had, oh, yeah. I, had Looney, I had a bunch of dope records, and then I dropped Ultimo Guerrero a year later with Nori as in the single, Muevete. But the reason I dropped those albums so fast is because I realized I didn't have a future at Universal. I think getting that joint venture might have been the worst situation I ever did in my life because they slowed me down. They didn't move at my pace. I thought I had the machine behind me. They didn't understand when I asked them, I need 50000 to wrap a van with the Cali Kings and promote in California and give away CDs. They were like, give away CDs? We sell CDs over here. We don't, I don't know. I need a street marketing team. They never knew what that was. They never had the street market. <laughs> so they didn't get the hip hop. They didn't get the hip hop aspect, which is what you said, what you brought to the game with the street team. Right, but heavy once promo. I signed the deal, once I signed the deal and I realized that, then we started to bump heads. 
Right. But right. now fast forward, the vice president of that label is Walter Combs, the owner of Combs Records, Malumna, and he's made his entire label off of urban music and the general manager of his label is my nephew who was running around at 13 years old. Now he's 29 year old lawyer who's the general manager of Walter Combs' new label. So we're all family, it all comes back around, but I continue to march along. People said, Danilo, what happened to you? Nothing happened to me. I made a decision that I was not gonna sell my ass. After that joint venture, I, I made a decision that I was not gonna sell my ass. So my show, everything was in, inundated with reggaeton. I didn't feel like doing reggaeton just so I could be relevant. I just didn't feel right. So I continue to take my music to Central South America. I own my masters. I continue to do publishing deals. I continue to learn the business. I learned the clothing line business. I've continued, I continue to drop albums and records through distribution platforms, but not, I don't have to spend a million dollars worth of marketing. You know, you get what I'm saying? It's just, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I made the decision that I didn't have to, I didn't want to chase the fame. Many, the fame in this game is extremely addicting. That's why most people, when they can't get the next hit record and they don't, they're not as famous as they were, they go into drugs and depression, right? Yeah. But m many of them don't even control their destiny because they're signed to these labels who own their inter intellectual property, which is their likeness, their image. And once a lot of those artists, you know, <clears throat> uh, Prince, before he passed away, but in the middle of his death, so he wrote Slave on the yes. side of his face he when he realized he, he was a slave. You know, you know, so you know. I, what I did now, fast forward 2015, I joined Chris Gotti. I become the president of the Latin Division for Adventure Music. And we hit the road. We did more than 150 cities in five years. And we educated and empowered. And now look at Just Oh Kid, United Masters. There's a ton of them out there now. So I stay in that lane. Right now, it's the greatest time to be an artist, uh, an independent artist. Everything is free. Uh, all the marketing is free. Instagram. TikTok, uh, YouTube, YouTube is your own TV channel. Yeah, yeah, free, <laughs> Shit. free. You know, if I would have came out in this era, oh man, I'd probably be a fucking billionaire right now, right? Just because of the stuff. So when yeah. you see me try things on TikTok and do the things that I that I'm doing, it's because I'm saying, okay, let me try different tactics that fit who I am. I'm still educating. I'm having a little fun. Sometimes I'm a little rough, but it, it's <laughs> to get a reaction, you know. Um, of course. And, and it's working. I'm actually going extremely viral on TikTok right now. So I'm using that and transferring more to Instagram. And um, and I'm just trying shit. And, you know, and I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, uh, on your show. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It, and I, I wanted to I wanted to get into like your your first of all, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that you're educating people also with ownership. Because, like, one of the things I associated with you with is always having that boss mentality. Like, where did that mentality come from? Obviously, you mentioned what happened with Universal. But, like, that whole mentality of I always looked at you like a hustler. Like, where did you get that? Did you always have that? or? Man, I've always been, you know, if, if you know, when I tell people a little bit my life story, you know, um, I'll just take you to high school. You know, in high school, I was uh, the, the starting quarterback on my team a leader. I did things in high school that most high school players didn't do. I didn't go on to college because, uh, uh, again, that's another story. I had college scholarships, but my son was born in high school. I made a decision. I stayed. I ended up joining the Army, in the Army. When I'm in basic, I, I scored some of the highest in the test. So they offered me, uh, I became military intelligence. I have a secret intelligence background. And in that, in that aspect, they sent me out to Oklahoma, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And um, out of out of ex out of the top recruits as privates, there were fifty of us in a cohort unit. Less than two weeks, everyone picked me to be the platoon guy. Again, I've always been a leader. I've always kind of known how to deal with in prison. The same thing. I became the president of the Hispanic community. <laughs> I kind of ran. I became a paralegal in prison. I was winning cases. I was doing. So I've always been kind of. If you ask anyone that knows me. I wouldn't say the smartest, but if you have, Don De Niro comes from not having all the money in the world. I'm the alchemist. I'll take a piece of copper and turn it into gold. If you have an idea, come see me. We're gonna turn it into some money. If it's, I could, I could kind of point you into, hey, let's do this, let's do that. So that's kind of been my gift in a weird way. And um, again, in saying something, when, I, when it comes out of my mouth, if I say I'm gonna do something, um, I have something that's called vision and you might, I can go into a pasture and it's only green and you come back five years and I built a city there, feel me? I can see things that other people can't see. 
and and I think that's also my gift of the boss mentality is hey um, I think being a boss the, the best best uh, analogy or the best metaphor I could say is being a boss means I've taken a lot more risk and losses than you even tried right right you're taking chances I'm taking chances I'm constantly taking chances I'm constantly you know it's, it, and, and there's things that I'm doing is giving things my time I'm creating my clothing line come now uh, uh, the Cuban connection 717.com on Black Friday 2021 now will be three years since I launched my website but I learned the clothing line game through uh, uh, my my godson uh, Prince who had Gino Green Global and he kind of taught it to me and then I always had this idea he created the Cuban connection logo that you see he was a great designer and I've just developed this mentality of, you know, I'm going to push this and it's, and it's been, and it's in another way to market me. So now, uh, uh, you know, when you go in a supermarket and you see someone with a Cuban connection shirt or an Orisha shirt, first thing you say is, Oh, that's Don Nero's line. So I just yeah. got you to say my name without you playing any music. Right. Right. Back you know, what's funny marketing too. It's another way of, of not putting all my eggs in one basket. It's, it's a residual income, there's not a ton of work to do, you know, where I'm running around and shit, but I only wear my brand. Even this, I created from the high school. Like, I, I kind of love the creative aspect of my brand. Um, but that's just me on the boss mentality, being an owner, putting my own skin in the game, my own money, taking all the risk, and then reaping all the rewards when you win. You know what's funny? I And I, I respect that a lot, too, because, like, that was one of the things I was going to tell you as well. Like, I really respect the fact that you have, you're multifaceted. You have this, the, the fashion, you have the line. The line looks very good, by the way. I remember, you know, I've Thank looked you. at it. Hey, times, I got to cop some pieces for sure. Um, no, you know, I want each you to get a chance from the showroom. I got you, you feel me? Nah, brother, listen, anytime. Um, no, nah, for sure, definitely. Um, but your, your pieces are dope. I've seen them. I've seen what you've done. Like, I love that you... You're putting the culture out there like that. Like, I, I appreciate that because so many times I feel like, and this is no disrespect to anybody, but like, I feel like we're always trying to fit somewhere else. And it's like as Latinos, right? Whether we're yeah. Cuban, in my case, I'm Puerto Rican. And I feel like we need to embrace who we are. You know what I mean? Like, embrace who we are. Put our flag out there. And you've done that. And I respect that. But well, you know, I, I, everyone that knows knows I, I rep Cuban knows. If you know, I'm a Baba Lao. If you don't know, I'm in the. Of course, the, yeah, yeah. I'm a you know Yoruba priest of the African culture, Ifa. But, but at the same time, it's part of the Cuban culture. But it's part of all our cultures. You know, in Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, um, you know, the, the Puerto Ricans and the Cubans have a lot of things in common, including the flag. They usually yeah. say we're a pigeon with you know with, with the La Rosala, the Dominicans, the whole Caribbean, the Mexicans. I think as Latinos, we have. You know, um, um, within our culture, we have different cultures, and we're constantly yeah. mixing. A Mexican will marry a Cuban, a Boricua will marry a Dominican. Uh, you know, we have our own uh, the, the Colombians, and you have the, the the Argentinians and the Bolivians. And I think that we're so unique as Latinos that at times coming into the American culture, we're just trying to be American, not realizing that any application that I've ever filled out, even though I was born here, I have to say I'm Cuban. American, because what you realize about this country, no one's from here. If you read the history of this country, even the Blackitos came from Europe, right? That's right. The ones That's who right. were here with the were, the ones who were here were the Indians. You understand? So, um, you know, you understand your history, and you just try to be a leader. And as a leader, I, I can't, you know, I take risks at times because saying that I am a Babalao in a majority Latino Christian or Catholic community, you know. Uh, sometimes you're not greeted as well for the opportunities they're not giving as someone who's as clean cut as they say as a daddy Yankee, you know, always saying the right thing, never controversial. You feel me? Always, you know, that, and I, I'm, listen, I respect that, but I'll be honest with you. None of that stuff is realistic. That's why when you catch a lot of these guys in the scandal, you'd be like, oh my God, was he really doing that? Was he taking dildos up his ass? Yeah, I mean, that's who he really was, let's say. <laughs> not him, I'm just saying in general. Right? No, no, I know what you mean. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I just it's so comfortable being me. And I think that's what you kind of see in an interview. It's like it's no fake shit. It's, you know, it's just I'm me. You know, I, I'm not everyone's cup of tea, my brother. Trust me, because I'm, I'm brutally honest. 
uh, you know, the bosses that I'm around and when we get together, you, you think we're arguing, we're not, we're just moving pieces and we're saying, no, it feels like this, right? So I love being in that environment. Um, but at the same time, I love being in front of uh, young kids and who have a dream and want to come into this profession. And I, and I just tell them, that, you know, the formula is simple. If you're a good person and you have talent and you bust your ass and you don't give up, you will absolutely make it. If you're a shitty person and you have talent and you bust your ass and you don't give up, you'll make it, but you're not going to last long because you're a shitty person. <laughs> now, now, if you're a piece of shit and you don't have talent, <laughs> you ain't going nowhere, right? Your life is what it is. So, you know, I just tell people, stay the course. You know, um, I'm, I'm about to drop a book next year that I've been working on for over 10 years. It's called La Formula 16 Lessons. I'm actually in the process of finishing the animation aspect of it. I have the hard, the hard copy in English, Spanish. I have the uh, audio in English, Spanish. I'm finishing the animation. And one of the reasons I created this book is because one of the things about going around and being a boss and all those other things, titles that people kind of give you or they see you as, they also see you as an opportunity that if you say, hey, or you help them, their life is going to change. So that puts a lot of responsibility on me. So I'm like, wait a second. I kind of put it back on people and say, hey, there's a formula to life. And I want to kind of teach you what I've kind of done or as a Baba Lao, the philosophies that apply to anyone, regardless of what your faith is, that's going to help you kind of live heaven on earth. Because the first thing is pick a dream, Baba. Pick a, yeah. a direction. You know, we all have GPS on our phone, right? Yeah. Now, how does GPS work? You have to do what? You got to put your location. Besides your location, you got to put where the fuck you're going. Well, that's why. Okay, that's where either what the destination is. You got to put your destination. You have to put a direction to where you're going. If right. not, the GPS what? Doesn't do shit. <laughs> you know how many people have GPS? We all have GPS. Yeah, they, I, always not have a direction. I always have a fucking direction in. I'm going somewhere. Most people look at the GPS and they're so scared to fail, they never put a direction in there. Like, fuck it, I'm just going to stay here. Wow. I'm not going anywhere. That's deep. That's deep. Right? Think about that. That's deep. They're no, you're so right. That's to deep. Fail that they have the GPS. They think it's hard and it's simple. Just fucking do it. Put the, where do you want to go? I want to go to the White House. Put the address. But guess what? New York to the White House is fucking three and a half hours. No, but I want to get to the White House in 30 minutes. Well, jump nope. on a fucking plane and it's going to cost you more. Right. Right. So a lot of people, you know, if you pay, if your dream is to get to Miami from New York, it's a 20, 24 hour drive. You can't get there in seven hours. People want to get to Miami, want to get to their destination in life in seven minutes. Fuck seven hours when it takes 24. And I always speak in metaphors because that's if I. And no, you know, I, I the like that. You wear it, and everyone would understand it when I'm talking about it, and I think that's why they understand. Where do you want to go? The further you want to go, the farther you want to go, it's going to take you what? Longer, Longer to get there. How many years does it take to graduate college? Depends. You could graduate in, you could How get a four. Year simple. How many years does it take to graduate high school? Four. 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 Right? People want to graduate their business that they just started in four months, and they want to know it's not a million in four months because they started selling shoelaces that have grit of glitter on them or whatever the fuck it is, right? Let's say whatever idea, because it takes you four years for anything. That's to well get said. your associates, you get people only go for their associates because they don't want to go for their bachelors because it's what too long. Longer. Ah, when you see a doctor, why do you respect them? Nigga sucked up 12 years of fucking school and a three years internship at a hospital. But now he's fucking 38 driving a BMW making 250 a year. But he ate fucking cheese sandwiches and was popping Adderall to stay up all night to study. Right? People don't <laughs> see you. People don't Sacrifice. see you struggle by yourself. I'm pretty for sure for you to create this show many times. You have to sit back and figure out how am I going to do? I got to invest in the mic. I got to. Do you understand? You're out here searching. Yeah. You hit me up. I'm on this show because I understand what you're trying to create. And you showed me so much love and respect. How can I not give it back? There's no I way I feel that. that I'm better than you. The only thing I have over you is a few years on this planet. That's it. Now, I appreciate that. And I'm actually in the clothing game too, which is, um, you know what I mean? So, um, but I really do appreciate that. You understand that. the aspect of creating something and watching someone wear it. 
and the gratification. When I get people spending money on my line and I'm sh we're shipping stuff to customers, that's like, fuck. That makes me be like, wow, this shit was really working. And then you don't see me going crazy marketing because I don't want to be too, too busy selling clothes. I'm really, I, I, it's just something that, so lots of times when I do coats and certain things, I only do X amount of pieces. I don't do as many pieces. You know, I'll sell out quick. There's no more of those shirts. Even though people want more, I'll say, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm weird when it comes to that because I want my brand to be an exclusive brand. I you don't like, want yeah. everyone. That's what I was going to say. You want, you want the exclusivity. to wear my brand. But when you do wear it, you're getting quality and you feel like, oh, shit, I got on a Cuban Connection shit or I got on a Yemaya shit or whatever, you know? Now I wanna I wanna take this time to show a segment. This is a segment called um this is a segment called what Santo said, right? So on this segment, I'm gonna go back to a, a small clip of a previous episode of something I said. I'm gonna react to it and then I'm gonna ask for your opinion. All right? All right. All right, so I'm gonna share this real quick. Hold on. So let's get to it. This is called what Santo said. Here we go. We should never just merely exist. I think so many times we, we get caught up in just existing, myself included. And it's not fun to exist. It's not fun to just exist. That's not your purpose. Finding your purpose and running with that is a big key. And, and you find that you'll be happier too. You so that was it. That was just on this episode. I was just breaking down like where I got the idea for my brand Santos Threads. And so basically what I was doing was just talking about how, you know, it's a lot of struggle, sacrifices. You got to put in the work and the effort. And so what I was saying was, you don't want to just be going back and regretting not doing what you wanted to do. You know what I mean? What are your thoughts on that? Just making those sacrifices and saying, all right, I'm not going to be ordinary. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go get it. Well, the interesting thing in my book, I write about, um, you know, the reason you are here. You know, we all have a destiny to fulfill. Um, and your existence is to find your purpose and your destiny. And everyone here has a, this is your purpose and your destiny is to create, right? You're creating the show. Think about your life, everything you've done. You've created it. You come up with an idea, you talk about it, you act on it, you get a response and you keep creating, right? So, <clears throat> you know, when, when, you, when you say what you said about just existing, it comes back to the GPS. The fear of failure has people just existing, just in their comfort zone, dying. You know where some of the greatest ideas are right now? In the fucking cemetery. They died with people. They took it with them. I was speaking to my boy who he's, he creates a multimillionaire, young guy I did business with. He's like my, my younger son. And I'm about to go to Colombia now, Medellin, at the end of this week to throw a huge event. He's building buildings out there. And I speak and I say, hey, look, you got all the money in the world. You're young. You're going to keep creating money. That's your gift. What's going to be your legacy? Because Right. And then I'm trying to get him for us to build this foundation that's called Todo Fun Sueño that I want to do in Colombia. Start off in here, too. It's helping people in prison and people everywhere to figure out their dream. Because one of the reasons you're caught up, everyone wants to belong to something. The reasons, you know, gangs are recruiting young kids left and right is because they want to belong to something. Man. You know what I'm saying? You want to belong, you know, if you play football, you're like, yeah, I'm part of this football team. You, Everyone wants to belong to something, bro, and they want to belong to a winning side, and they're willing to do whatever. So they get caught up in shit, and they go end up going to prison, and, they, and that's the direction they put in their GPS. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. And right. We can kind of redirect that, and, and that's kind of... You know, my purpose now in life, if, you know, I, at my age, I'm 52 years old. And my purpose now, besides guiding my sons and my daughter and my grandkids, is anyone that I come across it, that I see them, you know, there's a there's a formula. And, and actually being positive, you know, acting, you know, moving. What are you going to do today? You don't have any money. Do you have a plan? What's the plan? Are we going to sit here and soak and, and cry? Guess what? Everyone has problems. No one gives a fuck about your problems. Mm -hmm. Focus on your solutions. Let's go. We all got something. I got guys who got money, but their parents are on cancer. Like everyone has something. Life is five holes and eight pegs. What are you gonna live out? Oh, you want to be a multimillionaire? You're not gonna be at your fucking kid's soccer game, Papa. 
Mm-hmm. You're going to miss that. You might miss a bar miss for two, a couple of holidays, a birthday, a Christmas, and a New Year's. Can your family handle that? Can you handle that? Do you understand? Like, it, life is about two things, choices and decisions. And whatever you have today is based on your choices and the decisions you've made in your life. <laughs> oh, my baby mama's this and that. You chose to shoot that <laughs> shot inside of her, brother. Now you're complaining. What would you promise? What did you lie? What happened? You know what I'm saying? Like life, we try to, are you handling your business? Are you bitter at her? Because she, like, you know, we have relationship issues. We, let alone in the hood, all the, all the mental issues we have. So, you know, and everyone's about money. Girls nowadays, if you got bread, they're cool with that. They're, they're willing to sacrifice love and for money, for comfort, mm-hmm. for roof over their head. So society today is going through it. The music reflects it. Everything reflects it. So, you know, how do you survive in this fucking chaos, social media and everything else, and how you stay true to yourself is an incredible uh, question that I continue to answer, not just myself, but try to find answers for others. As I, you know, find a formula as an OG who still lives this hip hop culture and loves it, and, and, and the game still needs me to lead it in its way, regardless of, you know, it's a marathon, like Nipsey would say, right? So I don't necessarily worry about who has more fame or money than me or, or, or who doesn't, right? Or who's just getting started. I'm just going to stay in my lane, play my position, and to get, continue to grow as a human being, as a father, as a friend, as a, you know, as a, as a mentor, as an artist, as an executive. And, uh, and you know, we could only live this life one day at a time. And I wanted to ask you about um, your music, because I always thought, you know, I always thought you and Domingo had this crazy chemistry. Like, I legit, I swear, I'm not even blowing smoke. You could have made a whole album with Domingo, and I think everybody would have bought it. Well, the first album I made with Domingo, he, he listen, Domingo, I met him, and Domingo, I met him when I was in the studios uh, uh, with Cuban and all, and Terra and Joe and all those guys, and Domingo, he sang Flowers for the Dead. Flowers yeah. for the Dead. So when I heard Domingo's voice, I'm like, damn, when I work on my shit. So it just happened to me. Me and Domingo had gotten close. So when I go to Miami, Domingo has a studio like kind of empty. He wasn't really, you know, he didn't have too many custodies. He, something had happened. So I was like, yo, I want to record this thing. So Domingo was a great, he used to play the piano for Frankie Ruiz. Like, he was a great dude. So I had all these ideas in my head. I showed up to Miami with like four or five records already pre-recorded. And I wrote all those choruses that he, with the exception of the Saolo way Asesino wrote. So I already had the vision for every record. So the chemistry was where I knew how to, I kind of produced that whole shit. I kind of knew the idea I wanted, everything. And it just always worked. That's why I called him back when I did Ante La Calle, even though someone else did the production for that. Um, you know, Domingo's voice is incredible. You could feel yeah. the soul in his voice. He has a soulful Latin voice. Yeah, very incredible, Latin, very Latin incredible voice. Incredible talent. But because of because of he did every beat, I you know, he got all the production credit on that. He became a superstar producer after that. People was after his ass, not only for the beat, but for to drop a hook on your shit and kill it. So yeah, yeah, we had great chemistry. I've had great chemistry with a ton of artists. Right now I'm working with <clears throat> Richie Rich. Be on the lookout for him. He's, uh, he's got a new album coming out soon, Mis Raices. Um, work with Prida. Prida, again, he created the, he did that Noel Carol G beat. He's done a ton of stuff for Bad Bunny. Um, he just did the, one of the records called Ella. He did the production of that. So I'm always working with a lot of young, you know, Capito Santos, Dominican kid from the Heights. Um, you know, always working with young talent, uh, Dominican girl who sings on Fina, Joe. So uh, the list goes on, man. I, I work with all of them. And uh, always giving them advice of ownership, not trying to sign anybody, you know, because that's unrealistic. You're better off, you know, uh, helping them get to where they need to get to. And then once they're buzzing, if we need to make a business decision and, and tag along with a label and make the right deal, then that's different, right? Like on a partnership level. Well, you have, I always tell artists, create leverage. You know, the fans are out there. Just use social media. You don't need the label to get fans anymore. Nope. Get a nope. good placement on Spotify. That's better than fucking Hot 97 spinning your shit. Right now, yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, nope. it has to be about right now because it's the uh, the time we're living. It's not about yeah. radio anymore. Nope. Nope. They lost all the you leverage. Know? 
Well, it, it's technology took that away from them, and actually, every every uh, radio station has a dot com. You can right. listen to them on an app. They just they haven't figured out how to totally transfer that over, but that's what's going to happen. Where you know, buying that space so that or that people can listen to you all over the world, it's going to become global. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's where we're going. Social media is global media. Yeah. You know, you can now find out anything that's happening around the world. Just Instagram will let you know right away. Bum. So the monkeys fell off the tree in Australia. Squeaky. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't stop. So that's the world we live in. Either you adjust when you mention you're enjoying my TikTok. Either you will adapt or die. That's a, a, a great philosophy in life and business, you know? No, nah, I, I respect that a lot. Oh, and I, I told you I wanted to talk about this, right? Because I know you from the Heights originally. A lot of people yeah, don't know New York. Right, a lot of people don't know the New York Cuban um, history movement. They were all in the Heights, yeah, and then they talk all about moved that. Berg in West New York. So you know, the Cubans in the '60s when they started coming in, to, doing the situation with uh, when Fidel took over in 1959, a lot of Cubans left the country. When in 1960 he nationalized everything, where he took over all companies, every all the people, you know. They wasn't down with all those who weren't down with that left. My dad left, my mom left. So, uh, you know, my mom and my dad, they lived in the Heights. They met. I was born, I was born in Roosevelt Hospital. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I was born and raised in the Heights my whole life. You know, I went to high school. I graduated from George Watson High School in 1987. You feel me? To this day, my kid's grandmother lives on 147 between Broadway and Amsterdam. My gosh, you know, I'm up. So, you know, look at the movement now with Taligoy and all those guys and Lito Quirino, which is someone yeah. that yep. I personally deal with now, my man. Oh, so I have incremental, you know, my kids are half Dominican. You feel me? From from uh, my, 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 the first mother of my two first kids. So, you know, Dominicans are, uh, you know, most of my, my childhood friends and, and, and day ones are Dominican. You feel yeah. me? So that's in my blood. And, and, and they gave me the name Cuba because I was... It's one thing to be a Cuban in Miami, to be a Cuban in the Heights. So as the Cubans were leaving, the ones that stayed and the Dominicans were coming in, chasing the American dream. Back then, you know, the Heights was crazy in the 80s with the crack and everything that was going yeah, down. Yeah. And, and I was in the middle of all that. And, then, you know, and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of different aspects of, of life. One of the reasons I joined the Army is when I didn't take my college scholarship is they were killing so many of my friends that were high school football teammates at a young age, you know, 19 and 18 and 20 wow. guys that, you know, like it's kind of happening now too. But back then there wasn't social media, there wasn't cameras everywhere. So you can get away with a murder a lot easier back then than you can now. So I think there was, a, it was a lot worse back then, but that's another story. Yeah. But I lived those eras. So, you know, in my music, a lot of stuff that was reflected, uh, you know, if I says, out of the worst case scenario, made the best thing occur. And me going to prison is when I decided to pursue this rap shit really hard. And it changed my life because I said I never want to go back to that where they tell me when to go to sleep. But you know what I'm saying? Like the energy yeah. is not, you know. So everyone who who's in those situations, man, I have love and respect, but try to get out and, and, and just try to do the right thing to stay out because that's not a, your family misses you. You can't do nothing for your kids. You ain't really making no bread in there like that, right? So no. it's like a lose-lose situation. And there's something that I realized that's the most valuable thing in your life. You can lose a million dollars and get it back. You can crash your car and buy another one. You can't get back time. Yeah, no, I believe that. Precious, with my time on this planet, what I've realized, the most precious thing you you have money can't buy the love of your, your parents your siblings your sister your wife whatever your brother your husband however those things are priceless you know the other things is the house burns down you got insurance you build another one it might be inconvenient lay in a hotel three or four months whatever the fuck but really you know so and i think we take for granted i think we're in a society today especially in this country that's all about the money that we make everything about money so, yeah. you know, I'm Don De Niro and the oxymoron is, is that, you know, it's not all about the money. That's what's crazy. Hey, you yeah, had to come so. up with a name. You had to come up with a name. That was the name. No, no, no. Again, I don't, I don't, I, you know, that's, uh, you know, like my name is my name. It's, it's, it's my brand. But what I'm saying is that the irony of life. Yeah. Is that it's not all about the money. You know, there's so many things money cannot buy. 
you know, but you need it. You need it to build a life. You need it in this society to to do things in your life and, and, and really to help the people you love the most. But I think that the most you can do is try to accomplish things and then help. You know, Shaq said something interesting the other day. He told his kids, y'all not rich, I'm rich. <laughs> in the sense is, go to school, learn something. That's why I got all my kids in college. My daughter went to college, hurt her knee, but she built her, you know, her life uh, as a fitness trainer and she's doing a lot of great things. So, you know, all my, my kids are in college, the young one's about to go. And I don't, I, the experience of college is important, that education. And they use sports, you know, I use football to help raise my kids, my, the men, the boys, you know. Um, but I just feel that that education is important. But everyone's not meant for school. But you can still educate yourself through YouTube, through whatever. And you should try to learn something new every day, whether it's a word, whether it's something. You know, everything can't be you know watching someone's downfall you know the biggest problem we have with instagram and social media is that no one's posting losses they're only posting wins so if you judge your life by instagram you're gonna be fucking depressed every day so well like, said how little, how little billy make 1500 today or how you know what I'm saying whatever the fuck people go through you know so and i've noticed posting things that i'm just posting and i get hate you know i get you know i get flies <laughs> You know, and, and it's okay. You know, if I get you to comment on anything that I do, it's a reaction. I don't, love or hate is the same energy. It just comes from a different angle. If yeah. I get you to say, hey, you're a fucking yeah, or I get you to say, hey, you're the greatest person in the world, it's the same. You win. You win. Well, not only do I win, I, I got you to react. So you win too. Thank you, you know. You yeah, know it's yeah, not yeah. A, it's not a, I don't look at it as I only win. I, I got a reaction from you, so you're going to be looking for you know, but I'm pretty sure those, you know, that that, that kind of do that, I, I don't really think they put positive comments underneath anybody's thing. I think that if you're just miserable inside, you're going to constantly lash out and you're looking for things on Instagram or Facebook that you can, ah, oh, fuck right. you, that's not we really, like, that's who they are. And it's, I think it's reflection of their own life and those who are spitting love and bigging up people, I'm pretty sure their life is about love and bigging up. So... The, the beautiful thing about social media is you can kind of get an idea of who's who. Yeah. By the nah, content, for sure. by who they follow, the content that they're consuming, you know, the content that they're producing and putting up. You get a who's who a little bit of. So with me, you, you know, you get clothes, you get, you know, mathematics, you get fucking. Today I posted some shit. Check it out. I posted. Uh, Marketing one on one. I saw that. No, no, no. I saw that's what you I was seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw yeah, yeah. Oh man, business. that was now that one was interesting because I was thinking, like, where is he going? Because I, I built you up and I'm actually right. taught you something. I, whoever did no marketing, I taught you direct marketing, advertising, yeah. you reputation. Know. You talk yeah, about reputation, yeah, yeah. Bra brand recognition and customer service issues. I was dead, man. I was watching that. I was like, where is he going with this? Um, my favorite one that you did actually not too long ago was about the flies and the shit. Yeah, and yeah, the, the, the bees. bees. The bees. Yeah, I'm telling you, Dinero, I'm telling you, I watch you. I see, I seen that, and I was like, that was good. Yeah, that was I really also, good. you know, I do the things about not playing with her heart. She has one, play with a titty. She has two. Of right, those. right, right, right. She has two you of know, those. So that was a good it's one. Joking is there, so I also get thanks. I big up. Uh, you know, again, I'm just trying to be me. People around me know I'm always fucking around, and those close to me, those who don't get to know me, will get another side of, you know, I don't really want to be bothered, so I keep it moving. I don't really look at people when I walk. I'm kind of in my own world planning. I don't get caught up in, you know, why are you looking at me? Or, But I'm up and down. I'm in Union City. You can catch me walking the streets everywhere. I have my office here. I love to be with the people, the Latin people, the community. I love to see the, the dream and the gleam in the eye and the depression at times and and all the problems that we deal with as human beings, it's important because uh, life is a series of ups and downs, right? Yeah. If I, if you put your stuff, an AKG in a heart machine, where does it go? Boop, 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 right? It's up and down, up and down. If it does this, be what does that mean? Over. You're dead, right? Mm -hmm. If your life is like this, if you're trying to live like this, you're dead, Papa. You're not living. Yeah, not living. You know how the movie ends for all of us? How many yeah. movies have you, let me ask you a question. How many movies have you watched that the star of the movie dies? I'll wait. Not a lot. Very few. Very few. Very few. Guess what? You're the star of your movie. You know how it ends? Yeah, they all we all go. 
okay, so focus on living because you already know the outcome. Right. And it's a lot. When you do it that way, life becomes, I don't care how many assets, how much money, how many material shit you consume. Can't take anything with you. The only thing you're going to leave behind is your legacy and your memories. And if no one hangs a picture of you on their wall, you are nobody on this planet. Wow. That, that's, that's deep right there. Um, before we wrap it up, let us know what, what, is, what to look out for, what you have going on right now. What's next for Don Dinero? Well, next I'm working on my, uh, on my fall line that I'm going to drop on Black Friday. So look out. If you get a chance, go to my website, cubanconnection717.com. I have everything there, music. I have a ton of photo galleries. You can see who's been wearing the brand and all the new stuff that I have that I dropped <clears throat> for the spring and the summer for the Odisha line. Now we're getting ready to do fall and winter on Black Friday. We'll drop. Uh, again, I'm finishing this book. I have an album I've been working on, but I, I, sometimes I, this year I don't want to just drop music. I dropped an album this year. I want Richie Richie. I got a great single with him that he's going to drop. I'm working with other artists, developing, writing, um, and kind of just living life, being a father. like I've been blessed that being an owner of my intellectual property, I'm not out on tour a lot. I don't necessarily have to do a ton of record. You know, I'm about to leave to Medellin this weekend, but that's still a 10 a good friends event. But um, I try to kind of, during football season, I kind of stay home because I enjoy Friday night. My son's at a playoff game. My other son's playing college football. I go up to Troy, New York, upstate, a couple hours in the morning, spend hours there, come back. So to me, the most important thing in my life is, is to be a father and, and, and be a mentor to my kids and be an example to those. And then from there, you know, try to give that advice. But I'm far from perfect. You know, we all have uh, all our imperfections. You need to embrace them, keep working on them. Love yourself more than anyone can love you. That'll help you with your mental health. Um, and man, and, and life's a fucking incredible journey, brother. Strap your boots up and fucking take a ton of risk. Don't have any regrets. And life becomes beautiful, man. Well said. Well said, man. Don dinero. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we gotta connect because I, I definitely I like I, I gotta get some of your merch. So my uh, brother, definitely. It's all love. I, I would tell you again, continue to build this platform. I'm, I'm grateful to utilize this platform to kind of give my message of, of of you know who I am, where I'm at, and where I'm going, but at the same time to tell you. You have a journey, you have dreams, you have goals from your clothing line. I don't know if you're a father or not. But I am. Yeah, yeah, I have two kids. Relationships, you know, when call it the aspect of being a dad, what happens is that their dreams become your dreams. And you can become a facilitator of dreams when it comes to your kids, whether it's buying them the cleats for soccer or football, whatever that is, being in the stands when it's fucking cold, which is going to be Friday, <laughs> supporting you know, his brother wants to come. Now I just realized I got to drive in the morning, Friday morning, two and a half hours, pick him up in Albany, drive back. We'll be back because his class ends at 150. He can't miss it, but he wants to come to, no, they're being guys. So this is what I do. And I love it. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, I, I love being a dad and then everything that comes along. Don De Niro is, is, is an alter ego I created, just like you've created your brand and expression so everything you have in your life you've created from your kids to your radio station to your clothing line to your relationships that you cultivate so i would tell you don't stop creating keep taking risks keep living your life and whatever whatever's meant for you will always come to you thank you very much and and, and same to you as well man we'll definitely we i look forward to seeing what you got coming next and uh we'll definitely connect man thank you all right. God bless you, my manito. Acheva di, balante siempre. Igual. Thank you. So, uh, shout out to Don Dinero. Man, that was great. Um, real good. Um, real good conversation. Great to have him on. And, um, man, he dropped some gems, man. If you go, go back and listen to that. Like, he dropped some gems. And so it was great to have him on. Um, I want to thank my guest, Don Dinero. Make sure you check out his clothing line he has as well. Uh, the music has got a book coming out real great. Um, once again, make sure to follow me on Instagram at Santos Thread Shop. Follow me on Instagram at Santos Thread Shop, Santos hyphen threads.com. And again, as always, don't just say what you mean or mean what you say, say what you chest. <laughs>